right, I'm Heather Soffer. I'm with the University of Nebraska Press and also um, serve on the board. And I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Jillian Wenberg. Um, her passion for Sandoz started in the fourth grade when she read the story catcher at the back of her parents' Winnebago while traveling across western Nebraska. Since then, she has become an educator, teacher, researcher, writer, and designer whose areas of specialty include writing, composition, rhetoric, 20th century American literature, <coughs> Western literature, and the history of the American West. As a reflection of her range of interests, her PhD from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, focused on both American literature and American history. Since 2020, her passion includes her work as an industrial designer, <coughs> excuse me, um, at Park University in Parkville, Missouri, and she teaches part-time as an adjunct assistant professor of English at the University at Johnson County Community College. She serves on both the Sandoz Board and Sandoz Scholar Committee, and I'm excited to see that she's speaking today about Sandoz's research and writing methodologies. So thank you. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction, Heather. I really appreciate that. And I'd also like to thank the board for the opportunity to speak to you all today, my family, my posse that came to support, um, all of us here in the audience, and our live stream audience out there, thank you for joining us. You haven't been forgotten. So um, with that, in honor of our 50th year, uh, and celebrating Sandoz, I chose to prepare a talk uh, thinking about her writing and research methodologies, really getting at the heart of how she did what she did. And I know across um, the lovely presentation that I know you all heard from Shannon, um, some of the presentations even today, we have some crossover, but this will be sort of a way to sort of put um, all of that together. So with that, um, when we look at the exact same event, Sometimes we can arrive at very different conclusions. There's many different stories to be told. And that's the fun part of history. It's, it's almost like you're a detective. You're, you're trying to understand a mystery. And with Sandoz, she wanted to get at that real story, but for people that she felt were untold and, and neglected. As she said in her preface to Cheyenne Autumn, she wanted to work to tell all sides of a story. Now, a great example of this that I like to use um, in, that includes both sides of history is that of teaching the history of the Dust Bowl and the Great Plains. And I'm so glad to be back in Nebraska where I can use this analogy and you all will get it. In Colorado, they're like, what, what are you talking about? Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. So when we think about the Dust Bowl, some historians argue that we had hard scrabble individualists that emerged taming the plains um, that were salt of the earth people working at whatever the land presented them, right? So, and unfortunately what happened was the Dust Bowl. On the other side of the fence, we have Balin and Thernstrom who argue that drought and a drop in goods caused the Dust Bowl. There are several historians who agree with this assertion and view the settlers as blameless. But on the other side of the barbed wire fence, so to speak, we have Don Worcester and his colleagues who blame these settlers for some of what happened. He argues that the Dust Bowl was largely caused by the ignorance and greediness of the farmers, over plowing, over planting, and quote, an inevitable outcome of a culture that deliberately, self-consciously set itself that task of dominating and exploiting the land for all it was worth. Thus we have awesome settlers on one side and greedy individualists on the other. Could both be happening at the same time? So it's with that idea in mind, I want us to consider Sandoz's research and writing strategies how she really looked to look at both sides of history and try to find and reconcile what was actually happening, especially for groups that did not have the ability to articulate that will have the ability but did not have the opportunity, I'll rephrase, um, to tell that story themselves. I'll discuss Sandoz's background briefly, her research strategies, and the craft of her stories, what specific nuances, and some of which um, both Elaine and Jameson and Meg alluded to earlier. <clears throat> Sandoz's dedication to her research topics, personality, candor, and work ethic allowed her an intimate place alongside those she chose to write about. As we know, Sandoz used historical fiction, extensive or used extensive historical research to write her fiction. And she did not just write about what interested her, she researched it relentlessly. That degree was obsessive in, in, all, in all contexts when we think about it. She had note cards hanging from bags on doorknobs and bits of paper with notes strewn all about her research spaces. She sometimes even lived the experiences she wrote about. 
When researching Fowl of Heaven, for example, she moved to Denver and often stayed at the ranch she was using as her research resource point. For her crazy horse biography, she traveled to the Pine Ridge Reservation and stayed with the Lakota tribe, attempting to better understand their ways, perspective, and understand their use of language. Her advocacy for these groups throughout her writing and personal efforts shaped opinions in the Midwest and the United States. And that's really the so what. Why do we care? Because she was affecting opinions through her historical fiction, which is really quite remarkable at that time. But why would an author attempting to sell her work as fiction research and interview for the stories to be sure they are that historically accurate and with such maddeningly obsessive detail? A visit to her archives demonstrates the extensive amount of time she spent obsessing upon each text. The archives show tens of thousands of note cards in her research files, which join clipping after newspaper clipping. Written transcripts of interviews, notes, photographs, postcards, her personal travels, and calculations of weather patterns. I even ran across one note notebook where she actually traveled through my hometown of Arapaho, Nebraska, and she would note the types of trees in that location in case she had to write about that area, which I just found fascinating. Those types of details, though, allow readers to feel fully immersed in the actual history. If I'm reading a history book and they're talking about Arapaho, Nebraska, and they mention a magnolia tree, I'm like, that doesn't grow there. What are they talking about? So I, I'm, pulled out of the, I'm pulled out of the text, right? But if Sandoz mentions the you know, eastern red bud that emerged out the side of the Republican River, I'm like, oh yeah, I can see that in my mind, which is, again, one of the things that made Sandoz so good at what she did. If money or sales were her primary goal, there'd definitely be faster and less detailed ways to go about writing a text. But Sandoz's concern was not money. She had an agenda. Despite the fact that her own experiences afford a great amount of workable material for a text, Sandoz expanded her writing vision beyond just her own personal tales of intrigue, and she could have written for days about her life, right? I wish she would have, um, and published, but focused most of her work on others that had experienced injustice in their life. Notably, Sandoz's work does not weave often idealistic tales about the plains, she replicated the experience on the plains in a grittier and often more controversial way than other popular writers of the time. Her ability to interweave historians' realism with the storytelling of a romantic produced works that engage and cleave to readers' consciousness. Sandoz not only wanted to reflect re historical reality, but also represented life in a dystopic vein in an attempt to motivate her readers for change. In a way, her work falls clearly in line with other earlier 20th century reformers. As Sandoz signed a letter to her editor, and it's one of my most favorite out of any, sincerely, and don't mind if you don't find my work saleable. I won't. So she wrote about what she believed in. She was not a sellout and really wanted to focus on telling that story. Sandoz's letter and archival papers provide detailed explanation of Sandoz's writing methodology and her advocacy strategy, which centered primarily um, upon she traveled, she wrote, and she spoke. She traveled extensively through the Great Plains, the Southwest, and Rocky Mountains in order to become more familiar with the areas she was writing about. She viewed her work as a historical project. She wanted to tell the history of the people, not necessarily examine them from an outsider perspective looking in, as a sociologist or an anthropology might, an anthropologist might, but to look at it from that inward looking out. So for our time today, I would like to, to focus on her approach to writing stories of Native American significance, specifically Cheyenne Autumn, although her work, I mean, she does this in all of her works. Um, I, one of the main reasons I did is I knew Dr. Neshem's follow up to this talk would be probably talking about Cheyenne Autumn, the film a little bit. And I thought, so I focused specifically on her writing technique for that story. The strategy she employs in this example, she utilized again in her other works and will serve as a model for our examination today. This author, although small in stature, did not shy away from big ideas and controversy. Her tender, weedy look belied a simmering countenance. She took on Native American injustice like an angry calf escaping the clove hitch at a rodeo. Sandoz's activism on behalf of Native Americans and Native American rights was passionate. Misrepresentation in other texts and in Hollywood film adaptations disenchanted and infuriated Sandoz, particularly the reworking of her Cheyenne Autumn for director John Ford. She was angry about how Ford had changed Cheyenne Autumn and, and never worked with movie people again. 
She also took issue with the credibility of Howard's fast manuscript on the Cheyenne. Other films like Ford's The Searchers embody the stereotypes she fought so hard against. Her frustration stemmed from both historical inaccuracies and blatant intolerance and ignorance of tribal history. She writes, quote, why does everyone put these unsuian headbands on the girls or reference, quote, the lazy bucks, end quote. She took issue with the way Native Americans were represented from a historical perspective, but also with the way erroneous and hurtful and harmful judgments were propagated through those representations. As Delory asserted in his introduction to Sandoz's 2004 Crazy Horse, Quote, Sandoz's account of the Plains Indians during the 1850s through the 1970s surpasses other such works in terms of its accuracy and its clarity. She paints a clearer picture of events on the Northern Plains in contrast with other historians. Native Americans were disempowered by not only the colonialists there and government limitations, but as well as how they were represented. Thus, Sandoz sought to shed light upon these issues. So let's take a look now at the specifics of what Sandoz did with this text. After another author threatened to preempt Sandoz's work on the Cheyenne, friend Eleanor Hinman suggested that Sandoz take on the material. So Sandoz spent three years of research on that Cheyenne project and spent four months in Washington. And in a letter to J.D. Weimer of Stratton, Nebraska, she wrote that she had, quote, uncovered much material that has not been available to anyone um, anyone the part on the Cheyenne difficulties, end quote. She surpassed over 30,000 note cards when writing and discussed the difficulty in uncovering the Sapa Creek incident. Quote, it needs clearing up, Sandoz said. Researching for decades, Sandoz spent time around Cheyenne survivors and interviewed Northern Cheyennes. This took time as it was, quote, contrary to Indian custom to talk of those who have died, perhaps because they feared reprisals for the Sapa killings, end quote. So she asked questions and she asked them again. And she toured the area, and she found translators, and she went back and researched again. Um, and some documentation in, the, in a museum in Overland, um, you can see letters that show that she revisited and revisited again. That's where some of that H.D. Weimer information is as well. So Sandoz walked, and she traveled, and she wrote Cheyenne Autumn from the east so she could have access to government documents, as, as Elaine alluded, in Washington, the New York City Public Library, archives in the east, the Smithsonian, and the Yale Co. Collection. She thought it would be easier to stay in New York than to move all of her papers back to Lincoln. All of her research material, quote, filled her New York apartment, um, workrooms, closets, and even the kitchen, chairs, table, and all. The only spot not covered with boxes and files was the kitchen sink. One visitor even reported files in that fireplace that Elaine talked about that building or having. So in addition to her research in the archives, she relied on knowledge she would retain from wandering the ground of the Niobrara River Valley, drawing maps and returning to, quote, visit the, experience the land physically. She visited Stratton and visited H.D. Doc Weimer from the Nebraska State Historical Society. Weimer was able to help her investigate the two related massacres on that Sapper River. Santos was concerned with the accuracy of history and was incredulous at the amount of misinformation disseminated about Native American tribes she knew and researched so well. She wrote, quote, truly legendary material is important, historically, sociologically, and artificially tinctured with the white man's stories, read or heard, it is nothing, as you know, end quote. Here, Sandoz indicates how this important information about Native Americans, which is, quote, truly legendary, needs reporting. Yet reporting just another iteration of someone else's tall tales would do nothing to advance culture or understanding of these people, and Sandoz knew she must correct that record. Not only was she telling the story of the Cheyenne in this battle, but providing the historical context beyond and beside them. Thus, is, this is much more than just one moment of history that happened. She wanted to also foreshadow what happened as a consequence of that event. Sandal was doing exactly what she mentioned to a friend in a letter, capturing the story of the substance of which legend is made. As Sandow scholar Lee asserts, she felt, quote, American Indian history was essential to the study of American history. She was driven to tell a historically accurate and well-crafted story. So how was Sandoz different? The main differences that Sandoz sought, Sando sought to employ in her works involved concrete historical research and to approach a story from the Cheyenne perspective. She was practicing revisionist history already in the 1940s, as writing about an area she had spent time at and had called home. 
Even though Sandoz performed extensive research to figure out components of her work, she rarely footnoted her sources. Her notes in the archive reflect, though, that she heavily researched each and every text that she wrote. Yet she does not indicate that in the writing of the text. So let's think about expectations, right? As a fiction reader, as I'm reading um, any type of fiction novel, I'm not expecting citations in there. But if I'm a historian looking at a historical book, I am. So Sandoz knew that historians and those reading her work for the nonfiction elements may find problems with this, but as she said before, she didn't mind if others didn't find her work saleable. However, despite the glaring problem that a contemporary academic would have with a source who cites few sources, historians have found it acceptable to use her work now as her credibility is corroborated and well known. Her methods for obtaining this authority prove her tenacity and organization. Orville Prescott, book reviewer for the New York Times, notes in this 1953 review, when she was a, a child on the high plains of Nebraska, Miss Sandoz heard the story of the Cheyenne flight from one of its few survivors. She has interviewed some of the other survivors and dug deeply into official reports and contemporary documents. Her book is as authentic as it is possible to make, end quote. Prescott does see that her circumstances afforded her a unique position as a researcher. She was devoted, yet it was her inquisitive personality, almost as a detective, that drove her. Examining language also proved significant in a way that Santa strove to write a better story. She wanted to utilize language of the Cheyenne and telling the story from the Cheyenne perspective. She noted the difficulty in writing about the tribe as she found the complex problematics associated with the relaying of often culturally sensitive historical events. As Sandoz once wrote regarding a short story entitled Giveaway, quote, I hope I got a little of the feeling into the story, end quote. Moreover, Sandoz knew there was much inconsistency between the printed historical sources and the oral histories passed down from the Native Americans' perspective, the storytellers. Sandoz saw this as a problem and strove to eliminate and lessen that otherness by talking with the tribes, engaging in traditions, and attempt to understand this divestment of the othering space between the Native American and this white woman allows Sandoz to tell a story that no other author had done at that time. It was an ambitious goal, and Sandoz risked the possibility of alienating her audience, her sources, who she greatly respected, and her publishers. However, as Deloria asserts, quote, Sandoz has had presented a masterfully and wholly authentic account of the struggle for the Northern Plains during the 1850s to the 1870s, in which almost every line rang true. Sandoz was very specific to have the publishers and copy editor follow her specific words and language to echo that of the Cheyenne she had interviewed. And again, as we heard earlier, publishers would write back and say, no, change that word. We don't know what that word is. Put something else in there. And she would argue back, no, that's the word I want. And she, I mean, like really making sure every single word did work in her book. There was a reason that she wanted it to be the way she wanted it. And she would, as you can read in the archives, she was a very ardent arguer in the way that she made, made that, um, those pleas back. Not really plea, more like a demand back, I guess we'll say. Sandoz is clear caring for her sources display that she was not trying to poke fun or indicate um, ignorance with characters' word choices. Rather, she was demonstrating how concepts could be unfamiliar to Native Americans. And at times, she didn't get the language quite right because she was still looking at it from the outside, no matter what she tried to do. But she did her best. It was on her mind. It was a conscious choice to try to do better. And other times, she makes use of her language very effectively. And she was a particularly difficult author to work with as a result of that. Many letters from publishers to Sandoz reflect this. She struck to her decision to use certain idioms and language, and in letters we see the tenuous relationship between author and editor. Sandoz was not, by any means, a pushover. After Sandoz complete, complained of difficulty with her initial copy editor on Cheyenne Adam, Ed um, Aswell pulled him from the project, determining he had assigned, quote, the most thoroughly limited Easterner of his whole staff. So that was probably a wise choice. He agreed with Sandoz, um, as well, that is, agreed with Sandoz and supported her decision on her language choices, announcing, quote, there will be absolutely no editorial changes without her, his or her approval, asking only that she add explanation in the introduction explaining what she was doing. Thus, she got to keep her language. However, to his credit, the initial copy editor may have had a point about the edits he wished to make. He worried that her language might serve as one factor to alienate readers who are alienated in a sense that they are reading Sandoz's translation of a situation. The same critic noted 
In spite of its imperfection, in many ways, it is a remarkable book. And Oliver LaForge wrote, Mari Sandoz has gone inside the Cheyennes. Thus, although her method was not totally understood, her larger concept, that of the plight of the Native American, was clear. As another more recent reviewer um, said of Sandoz's work, quote, Sandoz displayed an exquisite sensitivity to the cult spiritual and cultural impact of landscape and topography and intensely conveyed the emotional, psychological, and religious in universe of the Plains Indians. She is staking a claim in the importance of accuracy and representation, as well as the impact that education can have on social change and social justice. Education on the part of the reader, that is. Ultimately, what is the purpose of this? Sandoz's drive here derives from her desire to affect change and also try to get the story out into people's hands. And it was not an easy task. As friend Charles Barrow wrote, quote, I can well understand what a historian is up against in his search for the truth. It must be difficult to sift the facts from the truth. Sandoz, however, tried to do that sifting. And that credibility was later recognized not only by the tribe she wrote, by the countless awards and invitations to come speak. People loved her. We are still here talking about her. Her Native American works and letters display her concern for racism in the United States, and she tracked problems of racism in the U.S. to Congress and other elected officials. Her advocacy, though, becomes evident in a letter to Mr. James R. Webb criticizing his treatment of her Cheyenne Autumn novel for a script. Sandoz fumes, quote, your concoction of the Cheyenne Autumn script is something entirely different. Has it ever occurred to you you would never take such liberties with great men of any other minority, only with the American Indian? Perhaps this will prove the last time for such libel. I hope so. In the meantime, your face must burn with shame. <laughs> she came for you, right? You know, so the fact that she was so passionate about what she was writing, this wasn't a job, this was her life. She did not think that the plight of the Native American was recognized or understood, and she worked to demonstrate that narrative as it unfolds, showing, not telling, the way the readers are exposed to injustice makes it appear that much more jarring. And you see that in other works where she's advocating for women or for the working farmer or laborer. The unexpected nature of the way and bets of full startle the reader, and that was done purposefully. She let the events and tragedies speak for themselves. And it is important that Sandoz is not lecturing her readers, because that wouldn't affect change. You know, if someone's telling you, you're thinking about this all wrong. But the way she tells the story, the way she allows the reader to empathize and sympathize with, with who she's writing about, it slowly begins to change that mindset. So Sandoz corrected or encouraged scholars, academic and writers that sought her expertise. You'll find countless letters in the archives where someone's, hey, do you know if this is right? Or am I looking at this map the right way? Or is this how so-and-so is related to so-and-so? And many wrote questions asking about Native American genealogy, historical data, understanding a particular custom or tradition, as well as just standard fact checking. Later authors do not deny that her source material and aspects of her work are some of the best records of aspects of Native American material. As Soffer argues, quote, sometimes Sandoz material, great swatches of it, can be found embedded, unacknowledged in someone else's book. The detail and information Sandoz obtained in her interviews through her habitation with tribal communities in the West allowed her some of the best information that is still used today. Sandoz found some historians' writings dull and uninvolved. Moreover, she found that varied versions of a history could exist, as we discussed earlier. Quote, she, Sandoz said, I hear Eastern rebelings of disapproval of some of my versions of American history. I should hope so. So she liked getting people fired up. Thus, Sandoz was interested in revising history, not only to make it a compelling story for readers, but also to share history. Yet, as many historians and readers are sure to have critiqued, the problem with this type of writing is the difficulty to assess what is true and what is not. So sometimes, she know, like, she's telling the story of the Sapa Creek incident. She doesn't necessarily know this specific conversation took place, but she's utilizing that to tell that greater story. So once the writer admits that set of once the writer admits that some of what he or she has written is fiction, the reader not only feels uh, a justified sense of betrayal, but is bound to suspend judgment about the credibility of everything else the writer has written. So Sandoz discerns this as an issue, but pointedly chose to disregard it at the potential of gaining more readers and more, uh, and more interest. So, for example, 
having a story around the, the table that is occurring that she is wholly making up, but the larger history is still correct, right? But she's telling that story around the table to really draw you in, to be more interested. So there are components that, again, she's fictionalizing in order then to tell that larger story. It is time, however, that, I mean, it seems academic historians have been at times quick to dismiss Sandoz's contribution. But it is time to evaluate, as we are doing here today, Sandoz's work and see the way in which this strong-willed, slightly obsessive, maybe a little mildly paranoid, author was able to rise as a progressive reformer and influential women in Nebraska and the United States. So some of Sandoz's purpose was to share the real history as it happened, but the fact remains, how are we as readers able to know what's factual or not? While it is commendable that Sandoz is attempting to share the stories of Native American peoples or the stories of women being disempowered or laborers and farmers, the, her embellishments, which really is a flattering way of saying fiction, could serve to alienate readers or at best confuse them. However, Sandoz would not look at this as, as a falsification. And Jameson, I saw you pull the Rita Shaw thing. And I'm like, I have Rita Shaw too. So this is a great interview actually on YouTube. And we, were only gonna, we only showed tiny little clips of this. But I'm going to show a different component from that same Rita Shaw interview um, that you also can see the text of that caption there if you need to utilize that um, as an alternative. So just a small clip from her. Someone that we just told the news, you know. This is part of your philosophy of writing, isn't it? That you, you should write the truth, whether it oh, shocks yeah. or... Oh, definitely, yes. yes. Yes, you have no right to falsify life, ever. No, yes. never. No, that, uh, that, I think, is uh, that's, the, that's the cardinal sin of the writer. And that's the thing that you cannot face yourself afterward, I don't think. If you haven't read Mari Sandoz and you love Nebraska, well, we recognize start that guy. with old Jewel. Get autographs after the presentation. So again, she did not look at it as falsifying. She was saying, if I have to make up an event, it's still telling that larger piece of history. So to wrap up, um, ultimately, Sandoz could justify small changes to the story if we're in line with what she thought the party would do or would have done. If it is well-researched research, well -researched history with the historian's best guess at what could have happened, and historians use this technique even today, using other information to make a best guess at times. She was creating a narrative around a core story and trying to advocate. Sandoz was forever picking battles and fighting for what was right, and this was something that continued through her entire life. As friend Carolyn Bancroft noted, quote, her crusading zeal and many dear causes, particularly for justice and aid to the Indians, end quote, lasted her entire life. She set forth to tell people's histories, and as a Sioux proverb claimed, and Sandoz credited Crazy Horse with stating, a people without history is like the wind on the buffalo grass. Sandoz attempted to rectify this for the Cheyenne people and other disembowered groups by researching and telling their history so that their stories would not whoosh and bluster away as a dying wind in the buffalo grass. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jillian. Um, are there any questions? That's a great question. I need to look that up. That's a, I mean, yeah. Yeah, that would be an interesting parallel. And I know you're busy writing other things, but that could be something we could collaborate on because I think that's a really good question when that became popular, if anyone knows. She's wasn't calling it what it was. But Meg, you had a question. We interrupted you. Which one of her works do you think has the most impact in society or efficacy? You're making me choose a child. This is hard. Everyone has a favorite. I'll tell you what I think the answer probably most widely said would be, and I'll tell you which one is my favorite personally. Um, so Crazy Horse, I think, just because it was the first biography of a of a Lakota leader from his perspective, right? And I think it's also one that had perhaps the best like public appeal if we're looking at sales. Um, I, see, I still think Capital, has, Capital City is one of my favorite. Um, looking at something from a different perspective, but like exposing the seedy underbelly of this allegorical city, and, and I'm from Nebraska, so maybe that's why I love that one too. Um, but I think 
to some extent, that one, and it's, it's earlier on. I mean, her writing, her writing changes quite significantly between that and Crazy Horse. But I'm going to also default back to my original answer. It's hard to pick one because they're all so carefully trying to do something and appreciating what her purpose was behind each one, especially now that we're looking back on it you know, almost 100 years later, I think is what makes it hard to pick one because you can see what her, what her goal, oh, I see what that short story is trying to do, or I see how that book was trying to go out and affect change and, and, and show what women can do, or even like Slogum House to some extent, to have Gola with her, her mustache, right? If you, Slogum House is another fan favorite, I would like to say. But um, thinking about what her purpose was, I think is also important. Okay, so a lot of your talk talked about the, the questions historians have about her sources. Yeah. Has there ever been, a, and her keeping as many of her resources as handy as possible in places that she lived, was she ever so questioned about uh, a specific detail in a book that she would then just pull out from her note cards or her own resources and prove to that person that, who or whoever it was that, it was legit. Yeah, and a good example of that, although I didn't get into it much, was the whole debate with Howard Fast, Cheyenne's manuscript, and like hers. So she was saying, this is what I found in my research, and he wrote something totally different, but she's like, it's totally wrong, and here's why. And she wasn't like doing it publicly, it's just letters. Man, you get into those archives, you can hang out just reading her snarky like letters back and forth, but she w would call people out. I don't know if in that scenario if it was a public call out necessarily, but if asked, she could re retain all that information and was brilliant in the way that she could just like recall it so quickly. So yes, to short answer to your question. Um. I know we're kind of short on time, but I actually have a question for you, Jillian. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so you're, um, especially with the, the details in everything that she would take notes on, um, I know she'd write them on little slips mm -hmm. and then put them in um, pieces, or bags that she could come back to later. So um, even just the detail of like Arapaho with the trees. Yeah. How much do you think that she was writing to the people back home as well? Because I mean, she was trying to get her work out to a larger audience for sure outside of the region. But how much do you think she was trying to prove to the people back home that she was being as accurate as possible and truthful as possible? And how do you think that may have changed over her career? I and, think that, oh, go ahead. Oh, in a short amount of, as, of time as possible since, sorry, Dave. I know we're running short. Yeah, well, we were, we were behind, too. Um, I agree. I hadn't thought about it that way. I just looked at it as, like, a historian always taking notes. But I think you were onto something. I mean, that desire for approval from the home state, I think, was there the entire time. But we should talk about it more. I don't want to over-talk Dave's opportunity. So thank All you. Right, well, thank you, Jolene. Yeah. One more. Hand.